Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Sophocles' play Oedipus the King, also known as Oedipus Rex or Oedipus Tyrannos. Um, so Oedipus the King is the first part of what's sometimes called the Theban Trilogy, which is Oedipus the King, Oedipus at Colonus, and Antigone. And I've done a video on the Theban Trilogy before, but I'm doing individual play, individual videos about these three plays because they're not actually a trilogy. They, the stories follow one another roughly. There's additional stuff that happens in the mid cycle, but the stories follow one after another. But these aren't, these aren't a proper trilogy in the sense that, say, the Oresteia by Aeschylus is a trilogy because that was. That was three plays that were originally presented together when they were perform performed uh, at the city Dionysia. The Theban trilogy was not presented together. In fact, Antigone was written about 15, 16 years before Oedipus the King, even though Oedipus the King is the first in the cycle and, Ant and Antigone is the last. So these are very... and then. Oedipus at Colonus was written way after that, almost at the end of Sophocles' career. So that's one thing uh, with these with these plays, is that when we read them as a trilogy, we we imagine them to be more sort of unified than they necessarily are. Um, and so when you buy, like a lot of a lot of publishers will sell the Theban trilogy or something like this, the Theban cycle or something like this, and present them as though they are a unified storyline, when in reality they aren't. They're three very different plays from three very different periods of Sophocles' career. So, that being said, um, the basic story of Oedipus uh, is that his father and mother this is going to give some things away, but that's okay, because the myth cycle is not really that secretive about it. Um, so his father and mother are Laius and Jocasta, the king and queen of Thebes. Laius gets a prophecy that um, he will be murdered by his son, who will then marry Jocasta. So, uh, Laius basically says, well, uh, we're not going to have any kids. But then he gets drunk and he gets Jocasta pregnant. And so uh, they have a son. And so what they decide to do, uh, as you do in Greek tragedy when you have a baby you don't want, is they decide to leave it on a mountain. So they stick a pin through this baby's ankles and give it to a shepherd to put on a mountain. The problem is, as we find out about two-thirds of the way into this play, the shepherd does not leave the baby on the mountain. He, in fact, gives it to another shepherd who then gives it to the king of Corinth, who doesn't have any children. And so, the kid, who becomes named Oedipus... Oedipus is an interesting name, uh, by the way. Um, in his introduction here, uh, this is the, the Paul Roche translation. I really like Paul Roche uh, as a translator. Uh, he gives us a number of different meanings for the name Oedipus, one being uh, derived from the term oida, O-I-D-A, meaning I know, uh, with the present sense of edo, E-I-D-O, I see. So two etymological meanings of the name Oedipus may mean, uh, may refer to knowing and may refer to seeing. Seeing is one of the really big themes in Oedipus the King, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, the other potential sort of major etymology is from oideo, uh, meaning I swell up, or oidos, a swelling, and pus, meaning a foot. So, uh, the, the potential English translation of the name that Roche gives acknowledging that it's not very useful, would be something like know-all, see-all, swollen foot. We'll come back to that in just a little bit, uh, because 
the, there's interesting sort of echoes of this, the meanings of this name throughout the play. But, um, so, uh, Oedipus is raised by the king and queen of Corinth. He's raised as their son. He thinks they're, they're, that he's their son. And then he goes to the oracle at Delphi, Apollo's oracle at Delphi. He's like, hey man, you're gonna murder your dad and have sex with your mom. And Oedipus is like, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to leave Corinth. He leaves Corinth, never to return. Uh, on the road, he meets an old man. They have basically a pointless argument about the right of way. And Oedipus kills the old man and pretty much all of his uh, servants, except one. And that's important. Then Oedipus just sort of wanders around for a while. He gets to Thebes. There's a sphinx in Thebes, uh, which is a sort of mythical monster, sort of part lion, part human, got some wings. And basically this sphinx has decided that it's going to set up shop in Thebes, ask everybody a riddle, and if they can't answer, it's going to kill them. So the people of Thebes are not super pleased with this, but nobody's smart enough to, to answer the riddle until Oedipus comes along, who answers it. And in gratitude uh, for defeating the Sphinx, they make him king of Thebes, and he marries Jocasta. When Sophocles' play picks up, there is a plague ravaging Thebes. Um, and Creon, who's Jocasta's brother, goes to the oracle, or is sent to the oracle by, by Oedipus. And what the oracle says is that you need to find out who killed Laius, it's someone in the city, get rid of that person, either exile them or kill them, um, and then the plague will be lifted. So, Oedipus sets himself wholeheartedly to this task. He, uh, he states several times that he will not be deterred no matter what happens, no matter who it is uh, that, that proves to be guilty, um, and so this is one element of his hubris, one element of his sort of arrogant overconfidence that the gods hate in Greek tragedy. Uh, the gods punish hubris uh, consistently. I mean, we see this with Ajax. We see this with um, any number of tragic heroes. Um, um, Prometheus in um, Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound is another great example. So, basically, Oedipus is investigating, and uh, he has brought to him the seer Tiresias. Now, Tiresias is a great prophet. He shows up in a lot of plays. Um, he shows up in all three of the, the Theban plays. Um, or at least his work, his words are central to all three Theban plays. I don't know if he actually shows up in Oedipus at Colonus, or if we just hear prophecies from him. But uh, he is basically like, hey man, you want to leave this thing alone, because it's going to be bad for you if you investigate. And Oedipus is like, well, then clearly you're guilty. And so uh, Tiresias is goaded into revealing that, in fact, Oedipus is the guilty one, uh, and that the plague is is his fault because he murdered um, Laius on the road. Oedipus doesn't initially believe this, and he he decides that Creon has worked with Tiresias to to spread this false prophecy to undermine Oedipus's kingship. Um, he confronts Creon about this, and basically Creon is like, "Yeah, I didn't do any of that." and you need to stop accusing me of shit that I haven't done. Anyway, this is back and forth, um, and then a, a shepherd is brought on who was the only surviving witness when Laius was killed, and basically this guy reveals that Oedipus was... Uh, it's a little more complex than this, but the, the, the short story, short version is, uh, this guy reveals that Oedipus was... Uh, the son of Laius, he took him out to the mountains, gave him to this other guy, etc., etc. He survived. He then came back 
killed Laius on the road, married Jocasta in Thebes, and the prophecy has been fulfilled. Uh, upon learning this, Jocasta goes into the house, and in true Greek tragic fashion, she hangs herself. Oedipus uh, goes after her, finds her body, he takes the, the pins that were holding her dress together, uh, these, these sort of um, brooches with metal stick pins on the back, and he jams them repeatedly into his eyes. Because again, we have this theme of seeing and blindness throughout the play. Um, and so Oedipus, when he sees the truth, now he's like he's enlightened he's realized what's going on he's seen the truth and so he punishes his eyes he punishes the organs of sight for his insight basically um oedipus is then basically like all right creon you're in charge now exile me from thebes i'm gonna go wander and that's basically it so there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Um, one of the things that's really impressive about the play, or at the very least about Rocha's translation, is how often we get these subtle references to the major themes of the play just encoded in the sort of basic language of, of the play. So, for instance, the first stanza of the prologue, Oedipus comes out. Um, a group of, of people have come to the palace to try and convince him to do something about the plague. And he addresses them. He says, My children, scions of the ancient Cadmean line, what is it that what is the meaning of this thronging around my feet, this holding out of olive boughs and uh, all wreathed in woe? The city droops with elegiac sound and hymns with po and hymns with palls of incense hang. I come to see it with my eyes, no messengers. Yes, I whom men call Oedipus the Great. So in this, in this seven lines, we have four significant references that point us to the themes of the play. So the first line, my children, scions of the ancient Cadmian line. Well, paternity, childhood, uh, fatherhood, are central themes to the play. Oedipus thinks he knows who his father is, but doesn't. He thinks uh, that he's the, the father of his children, but he turns out, it turns out he's both their father and brother. So this idea of Oedipus and his children, or Oedipus as child of the Cadmian line, which is the Thebans, because Thebes was, in myth, founded by a guy named Cadmus. So we've got that. Then we've got, what is the meaning of this thronging around my feet? And this idea of thronging around the feet, I mean, again, one of the etymological meanings of Oedipus's name is swollen foot, because he had a pin put through his ankles as a baby. And so he has this distinctive scar on his ankles or on his feet. So this idea of thronging around my feet points us to something distinctive about Oedipus. The sixth line here, I come to see it with my eyes. Again, this idea of sight, of seeing blindness, insight, uh, the unwillingness to faith, face the truth. These are central ideas in the play. And then Yes, I whom men call Oedipus the Great in the seventh line, we get this sense of hubris, this sense of overweening pride that goes before Oedipus's fall. Um, and we've got a lot of these references here. Like at one point, um, a lot of the, these ironically prescient references. So at one point, um, Oedipus says that he wants to pursue the murderer, the murderer of Laius. For who knows, tomorrow this selfsame murderer may turn his bloody hands on me. The cause of Laius, therefore, is my own. And then a little bit later, 
I am resolute and shall not stop till with Apollo's help all blessed we emerge, or else we are lost beyond all purge. So we've got two elements here. One is that Oedipus continually identifies Linus's cause with his own. Even to the point where at one, at one stage of the play he says, um, he says something to the effect of, I feel sympathy for Lias as though he were my own father. So we've got that element here, that, that identification between Oedipus and Lias. But then we've also got this idea of being resolute, of refusing to give up this quest, even if it's the wise thing to do. And we get this accusation several times throughout the play. Creon at one point even says, if you really think a stubborn mind is something to be proud of, you're not thinking straight. This is actually a super ironic line because in Antigone, which I'll do a video on in a couple of weeks, um, Creon is the one who is overtly stubborn, who's, who's hubris in dedicating himself to his own, um, to his, his own worldview ends up destroying him. Spoiler alert. Um, so that's part of the thing. Uh, we, we have this question of stubbornness, of pride, of overbearing self-belief. But the other element of hubris here is we have this questioning of the gods' wisdom, and we get this from both Jocasta and Oedipus, both of whom are destroyed at the end of the play. So at one point, so Jocasta, especially as she starts to piece things together and figure out exactly what's happened, Jocasta becomes more and more critical of the idea of prophecy, and she tries to get Oedipus to stop investigating. So, at one point she says, Ah, forecasts of the gods, where are you now? Then a little bit later she says, How dwindled are the grand predictions of Apollo? Oedipus agrees with her, and he says at one point, so are we done with del so are we done with delving into Pythian oracles, this jangled mongering with birds on high? Because one of the ways that you prophesied in ancient Greece, if you were a seer, was you read the flight patterns of particular birds around temples. Um and then he, he says, Well, he's dead, referring to the king of Corinth, who he thought was his father, and may he rest in peace in Hades' realm with all those prophecies worth nothing now. So this idea of challenging the gods, questioning the gods, doesn't tend to play out well in Greek tragedy, and it doesn't for Oedipus and Jocasta. Um, this fits into a very sort of central theme of Greek tragedy, um, which we get elucidated by the chorus at the very end of the play, and the chorus says, Citizens of our ancestral Thebes, look on this Oedipus, the mighty and once masterful, elucidator of the riddle, envied on his pedestal of fame. You saw him fall. You saw him swept away. So being mortal, look on that last day, and count no man blessed in this life until he's crossed life's bounds unstruck by ruins still. And these last two lines are really interesting because... Uh, if you watched my video on the women of Trachis, Dianera starts out that play by basically saying, a lot of people nowadays are saying, don't count anyone lucky until after they've died with good fortune. Here we get that stated very clearly and very directly as the sort of moral of this story. Now, the last thing I want to talk about very briefly with Oedipus the King is Aristotle. Because Aristotle, when he writes the Poetics, about a century after uh, the time of Sophocles, Aeschylus, and Euripides, for Aristotle, this is like the perfect play. And, and Paul Roche says this in his um, 
critical introduction. But the play didn't win first prize in the contest in the year that it was entered, in the city Dionysia. So Roche says, amazingly, this the most perfect of plays won only second prize. One can only surmise either that the judges were distracted by the beginning of Athens's death struggle with Sparta, or that the two plays that went with it were of lesser quality, or that simply the production in matters of actors, chorus, costumes, mask, and music was undistinguished. This is not not necessarily a bad supposition, but this idea that this is the most perfect of plays is really indebted to Aristotle, who again writes about a century after this, when theater traditions in Greece had changed dramatically. So it's an interesting question. The idea that Aristotle thinks that Oedipus the King is the perfect tragedy or the ideal sort of form of tragedy doesn't necessarily mean that in the 5th century BCE the the judges or theater audiences would have thought that. So it's an interesting uh, question because tastes definitely change by the 3rd century BCE when Aristotle writes. So it's, yeah, I mean it, I mean Oedipus the King is an excellent play, but I also say that as someone sort of whose understanding of theater has been deeply formed by Aristotelian assumptions. So there we go. It raises these sort of interesting questions about how we judge drama and what standards we use versus maybe what standards others might use in, in a different set of circumstances. <laughs>